the business there. Okay. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Anaira, and I'm one of the people facilitating this workshop, along with uh, me, Paul. Hi. And we've also got Carolyn. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> recording. <laughs> yeah, Carolyn right. from. It's very I'm slick. Straddling both CEC and TTP. <laughs> um, so I, we've got a little bit of housekeeping to talk through first, but actually I think everyone's so used to Zoom that um, we'll just go through it very quickly. That kind of with the little microphone, if you could be on mute when you're not speaking um, so that we don't get any interference. And I think most people have changed their name to, yeah, where they're based, great. Um, we'll be using hand signals. I'll go through them in case you don't know what they are, but uh, hopefully some of you have some experience of them. So this is for the facilitation in the People's Assembly breakout groups and just generally. So um, if you want to speak, kind of if you raise your finger like a point in the air, if you've got uh, a question, you can do a C for clarification. Um, if you're kind of doing timed activities in the breakout rooms, which we will be, then when someone's time is up, if you're the timekeeper, you can do a kind of polite roundup with your hands. Uh, if you can't hear someone, you can ask them to speak up by moving your palms upwards and you can show agreement with the wavy hands. Um, in the main room, I mean, there, are, there are enough of us for kind of all the screens to be on my screen and um, that of course as well. But maybe if you're, um, when we're sharing the PowerPoint, it might be a bit hard to see all of you. So if you've got anything clarified or you want to say anything, maybe just pop, pop it in the chat so it will mean that we'll definitely see it. Um, so this workshop, it's planned to last like two hours and 15 minutes, but we're not actually, there aren't that many of us, so it might be done in two hours, we'll see. And we'll, there will be a five minute break in the middle, um, but obviously take breaks when you need to and um, yeah, take it as long as you need as well. Um, and you can direct message any of us, any of the TTP team, uh, if you've got any questions or anything. Um, so this workshop on people's assembly facilitation training is part of the Trusted People Learning Programme, which is kind of, um, which Trusted People, if you're not aware about us, we are a movement supporting the growth of community democracy in the UK. That was born out of a desire for change and also a belief that we can actually work together to make a system that is better in which we um, can support each other and actually have a genuine voice and in which we address the climate emergency. Um, but to do that, we have to reshape our democracy. So a lot of our focus is on sharing democratic tools like people's assemblies so that um, we can go out and use them to kind of, yeah, transform our local communities and hopefully the country. Um, and for the structure of this workshop, we're going to start off with a quick check-in. Um, then we're going to outline exactly what happens in a people's assembly and how you might set one up. Um, and then we're going to have a chance to practice facilitation. So you're going to be put into some breakout groups for 45 minutes. And this is in the second half of the session to practice um, taking it in turns to facilitate. And this facilitation will be the facilitation that's done in the kind of small breakout rooms of people's assemblies. Um, it wouldn't be the facilitation if you're like a compare or an MC, because uh, then you're just kind of like setting something up. But we will also share information about that as well. Um, Take all the notes that you feel you need. We're also recording the session, but we will also share a manual that outlines everything that we've gone through um, for you to kind of like use at the end as well. So don't worry if you feel like you've missed something because uh, there is going to be quite a lot of information. Uh, okay, so to kick off, um, we're going to be putting you in some breakout rooms. Uh, welcome, Steve. Um, and to discuss this question that I'm just going to post in the chat, so what, in your view, would the ideal democratic society look like? So to get our democratic juices flowing. Uh, I'm going to give you a minute on the timer just to quietly kind of reflect on that before we put you into groups.
Okay, great. Um, so that's a, a minute. Um, we're going to put you into groups of either three or four, uh, and you'll each have about a minute and a half to share your responses. So you're going to be in the, the rooms for seven minutes. So obviously, if there's three of you, you've got a bit more time, and if there's four, you've got a bit less. Um, so please do use a timer just to make sure that everyone is able to share. So kind of for either two minutes or a minute and a half and um, listen actively. And we're gonna kind of think a little bit more about active listening later, but um, it is one of the core values of a people's assembly. And it's about kind of listening to learn, not listening to reply. So listening to kind of genuinely engage with what the person's saying rather than thinking about what you're gonna say next. Um, so yeah, we'll put you into breakout rooms now, uh, introduce yourselves and your response to the question, share your response to the question and see you in seven minutes. Okay, great. Uh, welcome back everyone. Um, before we, we move on, would anyone like to share their response to what the kind of the ideal democratic society would look like? If you'd like to share, you can just write share in the chat or speak in the chat. Or as I can see, you can put that as well, but anyone interested in sharing their visions? Yeah, go on, Keith. I suppose we, I put down um, inclusive, um, just, um, engaged, participatory, um, starting young, and, and it was also fun. I love that. <laughs> Great, definitely. And yeah, I think it's such a shame. I mean, I'm 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 on the side of bringing the voting age down to 16, uh, just because then you'd actually have to teach about how our political system works in schools. And at the moment, they don't teach that. Uh, it's like luck of the draw. If you've got a teacher who teaches it to you, um, and so that would kind of like yeah, do that. I think getting young people involved would be amazing. More and making it fun, definitely. I love that. Uh, I think I've just seen Helen. We all have the skills to communicate, listen, negotiate, starting from very early years. Yes. Oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, and Rosie, effective participation on a local level, equality, informed. Yes, definitely. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing those. Um, uh, yeah. And if anyone else would like to, you can just feel free to, to type your thoughts in the chat now. Um, so we asked that question because people's assemblies are about kind of upgrading our democracy. And um, if you've been involved in one, you'll probably be aware that they are democratic magic in action uh, and they're wonderful. So just um, before we kind of, yeah, kick off, what does it, does everyone know what a people's assembly is? If you, if you put your hand up, could you put your hand up if you've attended one or if you know what one is? So you can get a bit of a... Okay, I think almost everyone. Okay, almost everyone. Fantastic. Okay, well, for the, uh, just I'm just going to go through this so that uh, anyone who isn't aware is aware. So apologies if this is repeating something that you know. Um, so they, people's assemblies are a structured and democratic way uh, to solve problem solve, to discuss ideas, to um, generate solutions kind of collectively in a way that ensures that all voices are heard and valued. Um, and they can they can offer us a, a way from moving from small community led acts of change to mass collective action and campaigning. Um, and just quickly, they're not to be confused with citizens assemblies. So that's in which citizens are randomly chosen by sortition in a way that kind of is representative of the demographics of a country or a place. And they're put through a process of learning um, by a range of experts connected to whatever topic they're going to discuss so that they can um, then vote on a specific issue. But people's assemblies are self-selecting. Anyone can participate. You can do them anywhere. They're great for decision-making, for creating a space for reflective learning, for idea generation, for direct action. Hey, you can see one where we did that sitting in a road that was um, outside Lloyd's, the insurers in September. Um, or oh, they can be used to make a quick decision, like do we hold this site, do we leave? Uh, they can be used for feedback and also just to create a sense of community and connection, getting people talking about an issue and, 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 and understanding each other and practicing this like really um, inclusive way of communicating using hand signals. Um, okay, over, over to you, Paul. Thanks, Anaira. Um, so if you're going to do one of these, um, you need to build a little team. So it's worth thinking about 
uh, how are you going to do that before? And I find a lot of the uh, assembly preparation is done in advance. You know, the, most of the work of, of an assembly is done in advance, in my view, anyway, just getting the design right, getting the team, getting the facilitators organized, and the actual running of it. It's a bit like preparing for a marathon. The marathon's the kind of the easier bit compared to the training. Um, so you need to have these people in your team or covered at least. So lead facilitators. Uh, they're responsible for the overall running of the assembly, keeping the timing right, um, designing the session and delivery of all the relevant information. Uh, it's recommended you have have one or more co-facilitators that um, and that they are diverse as well. So try, try and make it um, as diverse as possible. So thinking about gender, ethnicity, age, experience of running PAs and so on. Uh, the second thing you need is an assembly note taker, lead note taker. So that will be the recording all of the feedback at the very end, making sure that everything that's captured by the assembly is 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 taken away and is kept. Um, so they're responsible for recording all the results of the assembly and feeding the assembly results into the wherever it's destined to go. So if you're doing it for a particular organization, then the, obviously the results will go to them. Quite often assemblies are just for the benefit of the people coming along and that's fine. Uh, and again, you would you would emphasize that at the beginning, making sure people know what the teeth of this assembly is. Um, so there's no um, misunderstandings that can come back to bite you if you don't make that clear. Um, so anything else about the, the destination? Um, I think that's that's all covered. Um, the next thing, and probably the one of the things that can make the biggest difference if you don't get this right, is the the question. Um, make sure you really think carefully about the question. Make sure it's a question that they can answer and it's well formed and well written. Um, so make it clear and succinct. Uh, if you're looking to attract people to the assembly, the topic is also important. So pick something that people would be interested in. Uh, people will show up to a session on a topic they care about. So it's worth spending time researching what, what that is. If you haven't already had an assembly and asked them that question, which is another great way of doing it. Um, pick a topic that allows for the full consideration of the key points to emerge. So a closed question like, do you want this or this is no good at all. So things that open it up to any kind of possible answer or, or better so there's some magic words like how might we they they work quite well um, in terms of um, research has shown that they often galvanize people and inspire action because you're talking about what you might do um, yeah and, and if you've got people who are going to be coming along and then you can meet them in advance then that's an obvious great opportunity to ask them about what kind of question and include them from the very beginning in designing what you're going to be doing um, the next thing to consider are are barriers to engagement so when you're planning it think about where it's going to be held is that going to prevent people from accessing it obviously there's benefits with online um, sessions because more people can get to them but then you don't get quite so much connectivity on the day uh, so there's pros and cons with that um, if you're holding it in person does the venue have provision for everyone can you get access to it for everybody um, what might different people's needs be in that particular room is the are the acoustics good all these kind of things is the seating movable if you're holding it online how are you ensuring that's going to be inclusive think about disabilities like hearing and sight uh, disabilities what additional support can you provide for people with those? Uh, not all disabilities are also visible, so be aware of the ones that may not be quite so obvious and think about how you can uh, support people to look after themselves. Um, think about how you can engage with people beforehand to help with those things. And if you're printing off a flyer, then um, you can offer people help at that stage as well, and then they can come forward and say, this is kind of a thing I'm gonna need. Um, and we've got a community assemblies manual, which we'll be giving you the link to at the end. And there's lots more information about that in there. So watch out for that. And I'll hand back to Anira. Thank you, Paul. Um, OK, so now imagine that you brought everyone together for a people's assembly. Um, we're now going to talk you through the process that you'd follow and outline the information that the lead facilitators will be sharing. So the people who are kind of guiding that assembly. Um, and you can view lead facilitators as a bit like MCs. Um, so they're not actually gonna be kind of like in groups doing hand signals, um, watching for hand signals, but they're gonna be 
kind of like, yeah, guiding the process. Um, so first step, often before you start a people's assembly, it can be quite a good idea to bring everyone into the same space. Um, and you can do that a range of ways by inviting people to close their eyes and think about something that they're grateful for. Um, or like we've just done, kind of getting people to think about what their vision for an ideal democracy is. Um, you can also do something like uh, that's called lighting, that's called a children's fire, and that is lighting a candle. Um, and this is something that's used in some circles and has been used in Extinction Rebellion. Uh, kind of like, I guess a caveat, it's not appropriate for all situations. Some people might think, it might, it might put some people off. So just be aware of like what space you're in, I guess. Um, but when the candle's there, I just managed to find a little candle. Uh, so you'd light it and then, oh, <laughs> it wouldn't, <laughs> if it doesn't light, it's not great because of what I say. Okay, so this flame presents all life on earth and the next seven generations. And it serves to remind us that every decision we make is not just ours to carry, but will be felt for seven generations to come. It can remind us that we are doing this for all interconnected life on earth. So if you're doing things that are kind of environmentally based, I think it's quite a powerful one as well. Um, and just to say it's, in, it's inspired by the Iroquois, a Native American Confederacy. And um, they use this seven generation principle to inspire sustainability. Um, and yeah, it's quite a, I think more groups now use it thinking about obviously the consequences of the, the, the decisions we make now and the impacts they're gonna have on the future. Um, would have been useful if people were doing that a few generations back as well. Um, okay, so next then we'd introduce the three stages of a people's assembly. So we've got the first phase, which is the setup phase. Then we've got the deliberation phase, and then we've got the integration phase. So during the setup phase, we explain the process and the structure of the assembly, introduce the hand signals and frame the focus of the assembly. So the question, as well as if there's going to be any input? Is there going to be someone talking about a subject um, before people go off and discuss and explain what's going to happen with the feedback as well? So where is it going to go? What's what's um, Where's that information going to be shared? Um, then you'll also explain how long the People's Assembly will last and, and kind of equal parts for each phase is ideal, but ideally if you can put more time into the deliberation phase, the better. Uh, kind of like not, yeah, because that's where the magic is. Um, then the deliberation phase, people are placed into small groups. So, I mean, depends how many people you've got, but maybe like between six and 12. Um, and they discuss the question or the topic of the assembly. And then the last phase, the integration phase, is people sharing back the key points of their discussions with the whole assembly. And then it's also taking the feedback where it is due to go. So if you've been holding one for a kind of, uh, I don't um, um, a community discussion on something, then you're going to post it to the community's Facebook page. That would be, also be part of the integration. Um, and yeah, I think kind of thinking about how long the PA is going to last, um, sometimes the integration phase can take longer than you think, and it's quite good to kind of be clear on how much you want people to feedback. So you might not get people to feedback all of the points of their discussion, for example. Um, okay, so into phase one, the setup phase. First, you're going to introduce the hand signals. Uh, and we looked a little bit about some of those at the start, but we've got make a point, index finger pointed up, a direct point, index fingers on both hands up. Um, now, this is for like adding extra information, not for just kind of like someone sharing a point that they want to say, because the direct point technically skips the queue. So it might be someone saying that we have to um well for example like with the if you're doing the people's assembly on the kill the bill thing being like we've got to get our ideas back in by this date because this is when it's being put through parliament and then someone direct point being like saying no actually that's not the right date this is the right date um then we've got agreement wave your hands clarification c shape uh technical point um maybe it might be about the fact that you've only got 10 minutes left to discuss the question Round up, so if you're facilitating, really make sure that um, you are creating space for everyone to share. And it's like, it's perfectly okay to do a round up to kind of draw someone to a close so that you can make space for others. Um, then we've got speak up. Uh, and the last one is a temperature check. So if once um, kind of an idea has been discussed or different points have been discussed 
and you want to think about, for example, what you want to feed back to the main assembly, you might do a temperature check asking for support. So if someone jiggles their fingers upwards, um, then they, they support the idea. If people are kind of horizontal, it's a bit ambivalent, and downwards is don't support. So you might be like, okay, temperature check, shall we feed back this key point? And then you'll see there. Um, and yeah, just kind of the aim for the facilitator who's going to be looking for these for these signals in the breakout groups is to just ensure radical inclusivity because that helps people trust in the process. Um, next, you're going to explain what a people's assembly is, and you might tell people a little bit about the history of them. So the fact they were used in ancient Athens to make decisions such as going to war uh, for men and uh, free men, so women and, and slaves when were not involved in the process. Um, in Senegal, they were used by the Inama movement uh, that, and they managed to oust a dictator through people's assemblies. Um, then in Spain, by the Ingnazo, I got, got this, this tripping on my tongue, I'm actually in South America and I can't say it, the Indignados movement to protest against the government's austerity policies. Um, and then this movement then gained leaders in mayor elections in Barcelona and Madrid. So the kind of these massive people's assemblies that were going on actually when um, directly influenced in government and got people uh, involved using these participatory processes. Uh, then in Rojava, Kurdistan, PAs are used to place power in the hands of the community. So they've got this kind of federated system of people's assemblies where they make decisions at all levels and the people who take the decisions to the next level are just elected representatives. So they, they actually say what the community has said. They don't make the decisions on the behalf of the community. They share what the community's um, perspectives and desires are. And then lastly, they've been used by flat pack councils in the UK. So, um, or not lastly, amongst many others. So in Froome, for example, they've led to the creation of loads of community initiatives, like a library of things, a community fridge, um, and their, their impact has, has been so great that it's also reduced um, A&E waiting times, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, you share a little bit about the history and the present, obviously you can adapt it to the situation you're in. Um, and then we recommend that as, your, as the lead facilitator, you would read out some kind of inclusivity statement. So we'll share the one that we are using, that we tend to use and that is in, in our pack, but you can adapt it to your needs. So. We value all voices equally in the assembly, as the aim is to hear the wisdom of the crowd gathered here and not to have the assembly dominated by individual voices or groups. We recognize that confident speakers are not always right and that those who are not confident speakers will often have the most useful ideas or opinions to put into the discussion. This is why we value all voices equally and we ask you to do the same. We do not tolerate any calling out, abuse or shaming. We welcome all people, but not all behaviors. Um, and then, yeah, this kind of just helps show people that you want to hear their voice if they want to speak. Um, but obviously if they don't as well, that's, that's fine. But just to kind of encourage people to feel safe to share and brave to share as well. Um, you can then follow this with something that we call a testify. So this is kind of offering people who are present say kind of two minutes to respond to the question, what brought you here today? Or to share something that's related to the topic of the People's Assembly. Um, and these can be really great, a really, really great way of getting people fired up and thinking about the topic. Um, but be aware that if you include a testify, it could add 10 to 15 minutes to the length of the assembly, depending on how many people you ask. Um, and we would recommend that you try and get a woman to speak first um, because kind of when, um, uh, when things have been done in the past. And I think also some like behavioral research has shown that if you start with a man, you might get more men sharing and it might um, it might put women off sharing as well. Hopefully we're moving away from that though, but just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, okay, over to you, Paul. Thanks, Anara. Yeah, so um, this, just picking up, but just following on from what Anara is saying, um, in any any deliberation we're trying to get into intelligent discussion so and to come up with wise answers so if you are doing an assembly which is answering an important question then it's it's a key part of that first part which is to provide them that information um, on the topic that they're going to be discussing uh, that doesn't always need to have to happen 
but um, because you may have enough information in the room itself that you're going to be extracting from people coming along. But if you're talking about a decision that's um, going to be substantial in a community and information is going to be needed, then you have to think very carefully about the setup phase and the input that is needed before you get, actually get into the deliberation phase. So it's an intelligent conversation and it's an informed discussion. So that's all part of that, that, that side as well. Um, um, but then once you've done that, it's worth just saying a little bit about how the process will run to give people an understanding about how they're going to be working together in this, in this way. So a people's assembly differs from a debate where one person is right and the other one is wrong. Um, and, and from the typical discussion or conversation where people have a tendency to dominate with questions and interjections, where, they, where they're just basically on a battle to be right and to, to win the argument. Um, so it's really important that we cultivate this inclusive and listening culture as well. So you're listening for things you don't already know, and you're really paying attention to the conversation rather than just waiting for a gap in the conversation to come in with what you already think. Um, it's also not, it's also it's okay not to share actively. So you don't have any expectation. We shouldn't put any expectation on any, any individual taking part that they have to say something, but you, you can, you can in, uh, bring people in and check that the, they don't want to say something. If you're thinking they're not, they're not saying much and then you think they might want to. Um, but this whole idea of witnessing a conversation is very powerful for the people who are taking part in that. So if you're saying something in an assembly and you know that everybody's listening, that's quite an empowering place to be. So that's what we want to try, try and cultivate. Um, so we're gonna talk about the three pillars and I these are linked to people's assemblies, but I, I use them no matter what I'm doing. I think they're brilliantly universal. And the one I always start with is the active listening, because if you don't have active listening, then all you've got is people coming along and saying what they already know and think. And nobody's really paying attention to what they're saying anyway, because they're all thinking about what they want to say. So if you can transform that into everybody really being present to the conversation and actively listening, and you can train people in this, you give them something to sort of reflect back. Um, it, it, it makes the whole assembly. So that's one of the key, key pillars to, to really kind of explain and encourage people to. So it's like hugging with your full attention. You're really creating that space within the assembly. Um, and you might want to, um, it's, it's easy to start mapping with your mind what your response might be while someone else is still talking. And that's quite often what we might want to do, understandably, because when we do speak, we want to get it right. Uh, but actually, if you can just pay attention, it's so much better. Uh, and then what you need to say will come and they can trust that. Um, the other thing is you can really, as a participant and especially as a facilitator, really support somebody expressing themselves. So feel free to support that and get everybody else to do that as well. Um, and the listening process creates that safe space. So that's a really key one. The other one, second one is radical inclusivity. So um, as facilitators, we're looking to include everybody in the conversation and making sure that everybody's being heard and attended to. Um, that create in itself um, a, an, a space that is demonstrably uh, equal. And it means that no voices are dominating. Now, you, you've probably all been to meetings, but most meetings are dominated by people. Um, and so you have to be aware that you're countering that culture. People will, some people will be expect to say a lot. And when they, when they don't get a chance to say a lot, then they can react a little bit sometimes. So, but you're providing that space and you're setting that tone from the very beginning. And usually they're okay if you do that. A uh, good thing to think about is this acronym WAIT why am I talking? And uh, it's a good thing to get people to think about, um, if, especially people who talk a lot, uh, get them to just question, is this contributing to the conversation or is it just me going off on one? Um, radical inclusivity also means being aware of potential barriers to engagement that we mentioned at the, the start, of the, uh, start of the workshop and uh, being aware of those and drawing the, those people into the conversation, uh, just being mindful of that and the final pillar is trust again this is this, it's a pillar for a good reason if you've got people or the whole assembly just don't have confidence in the process 
then it just can't go anywhere. So, but by asking for trust and putting their faith in you as a facilitator, it really does all those wheels. So I've never had any problems with people not trusting it, um, but there could be if you don't say this. So um, we need to build that trust in the process and the facilitators. It's not a perfect system. It's only effective if we all trust the intentions of the people in the room. Um, so if we work in humility and accept that our ideas may not be the best ideas as participants, and we work towards the best decision outcome for everyone. And if you say that at the beginning, uh, most people uh, come to the assembly with that spirit. Okay, back to you, Nara. Great, right, thank you, Paul. And welcome to those of you who've just joined. Um, okay, so then after you have explained after the three pillars, then you're gonna focus on explaining what's going to be discussed in the people's assembly um, so you share the intro information and now you're going to outline the specifics about the the, the pa that people are attending so, so there's some loud transport outside hope you can still hear me um, so frame the assembly explain why it's being convened so what are the aims where will the results of the assembly go what legitimacy do they hold is it a decision-making assembly? Is there a yes or a no answer that needs to be generated? Um, is it to generate ideas? Is it to get feedback? Um, so kind of just really outlining what's gonna be happening. And um, you'll probably, yeah, so kind of like making clear about the, the process. Um, and, and hopefully you'll have clarified these points beforehand in a process working group. So if you are holding a PA, then it's really important to make sure that you have got a group together thinking about these questions um, so that it feels like um, people understand why their time is being used and, and what they're there for. Because if you end up holding people's assemblies and, and it's not clear about why they're, um, why they're being held or what's going to happen with the information, then it can mean that people can like lose trust in that process and, and not want to attend them in the future. Um, clearly state the question. It might help if you have it written up somewhere, or if you're doing one online, making sure that it's typed in the chat so people can see it. Um, but yeah, having it somewhere visual is really important. Um, then you would, um, yeah, make sure you explain where the results are gonna go, but also kind of make sure that the input comes like now at this point. So if you're gonna have an input, I think it's, again really important to be careful about what input you're having make sure that it's it's relevant to what's being discussed that those who are going through the input um have experience about what they're talking about that it's balanced that it's factual because if you're giving input on a topic that maybe has a bias again it's going to lose make people lose faith in the um in the process if it's like incorrect then again it's going to um make people make it kind of discuss something and make a decision that actually might not be uh reliable um and relevant to the situation so kind of think about where you're getting your input from and you don't need to have an input you can just have a people's assembly with a question uh if you're holding mo multiple people's assemblies so it might be that there's an organization wanting to get lots of people's opinions on an issue then you've got to also be thinking about how can you make sure that the process um is as similar as possible across all of them. So how can you replicate that input? And it might be a case of getting a recording and, and then having people watching the same recording. Um, okay, and then that completes the, the setup phase really. So kind of going through the hand signals, the history of the people's assembly, um, the three pillars, explaining why that one's being convened, the question, where the results will go and the input if you have one. Uh, and then you're ready to move into the next phase. So that means that as MCs, you'll have finished explaining the setup phase and you're gonna go into phase two, which is the deliberation phase. Um, and this is where people will discuss the, the question in breakout groups of, I think six to 12, it depends how big your people's assembly is. And then they're gonna feed these back to the entire assembly. Um, so when you do this, kind of think that you're gonna recap the hand signals as well just to make sure that if people who are there who've never been to a PA um, are in attendance then they know how to communicate restate the question again just make sure that everyone knows what it is then clarify the feedback that's required so ideally you're going to ask people to 
share back one to three pieces of information. But if you're holding a people's assembly that has, that is of a thousand people, then you're not going to get every group to share one to three pieces of information. Maybe you're just going to get each group to share one and then collect in the rest of the information on notes. Um, and each group explain that each of the breakout groups needs a facilitator and they're going to facilitate the discussion, ensure that no one dominates, they'll keep an eye on the time as well, and they'll maintain radical inclusivity. So keep a note of who's waiting to speak, looking at the kind of stacking the points. And also as a facilitator, you can invite those to speak who haven't yet shared. So if someone's always putting their hand up for a point, then it's kind of perfectly okay to say, okay, I'm actually gonna uh, go to this person uh, next because we haven't yet heard from them. Because that's your aim. You wanna make sure that everyone can share who wants to. Um, and then the group note taker, they summarize the most popular points. So ideally uh, the summaries and the notes they take are as verbatim as possible, um, clearly giving the intention anyway. So try not to kind of analyze what people are saying for the note taker or, synthesize or interpret, kind of just try and uh, keep it as, as to what someone was saying as possible. Obviously, you can't record everything that someone said verbatim, um, but kind of just putting out kind of key bullet points is quite useful. Um, you can also look for wavy hands to signify agreement. So if someone's saying a point and there are a lot of wavy hands, then you might mark that down so that when you kind of come back um, to deciding what are the key points you're gonna share, you can raise the ones where there seems to be most agreement and see how people feel about those. Um, and the note takers are usually the ones who report back to the main assembly. So if you're having someone to come and speak on the stage for each group, it will probably be the note taker. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying to think, are there any other key things with the note taker? I think these are, the, these are the key parts of the deliberation phase. Make it really clear as well, how long people are going to be in these groups. So you might, for example, have 40 minutes with people just discussing the question and then give them 10 minutes to decide what are the key points that they're gonna feed back. It's quite good to have a kind of distinction there in timing so that um, people know that they then need to start thinking about what they're gonna share with the main assembly. Okay, and then once the deliberation phase is over, um, then you're gonna go into the integration phase. And this is where the lead facilitators, so the people who are emceeing, um, they call the assembly note takers to the front of the assembly. And then each note taker gives their group's discussion um, in the format requested. So if they're sharing one point, this is where they'll share the one point. Um, and the main assembly note takers, so you'll ideally have someone who's, who's the note taker for the main assembly they can verify and record the feedback. So by verify, we mean kind of making sure that they have heard correctly and it can help if they're writing it on a big board um, or kind of like verbally summarizing it. And then the assembly note taker feeds the results to the destination. And this might not happen in during that people's assembly. It might be something they've got to go and do after. Um, so kind of like posting them online or, taking them to, to a meeting. Um, so wh whatever you've said is, is, is the de destination, the results, then the note taker will feed them there. Um, and yeah, that should have been kind of clearly explained to people as well in the setup phase. So I think those we've, we've given you a brief outline of the setup phase, the deliberation phase and the integration phase and the key points on those. Um, obviously it's a lot of information to take in, uh, but if you've got, has anyone got any questions? Because what we'll do is you will, you will get this manual. So don't worry if it's a lot of it is, it feels a bit overwhelming. Um, but if you've got any questions, feel free to ask now and we'll share the manual at the end of the session. And um, yes, go for Simon. Um, you'd mentioned having a facilitator for each of the groups. Is that somebody who's part of the organizing team or do you just appoint somebody within the team sort of nominate them as a facilitator? So I think people can kind of like nominate themselves um, mm -hmm. and you find that often people are, are up for it. Um, so you might say kind of when you're setting it up, yeah, each group needs a facilitator. Can someone nominate themselves in the same way? Can someone nominate themselves as a note taker? Uh, it depends. I've been to people's assemblies where kind of they've decided beforehand who the facilitators are, but I actually think the ones that I think have kind of worked better are where mm -hmm. people uh, nominate themselves. 
Yeah, it's good from my point of view. I was thinking I'm going to need another eight facilitators pre-prepared and pre-trained otherwise. So getting somebody to do it themselves sounds a much better approach. Yeah, it's also kind of uh, when people kind of step into that role, having not done it before, or I mean, having hadn't done it before, but without the planning, I think it just creates a kind of quite a nice supportive atmosphere of people just having a go at something and trusting that they can do something. Yeah, um, don't feel like they're being monitored either as well, I'd imagine is a good part of that. Yes. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and you're not you're not open to vulnerable vulnerability in terms of being a, a, a imparting a bias from pre-assigned um, facilitators as well. And there's something very yeah. unifying about it as well. The the, the the community themselves are facilitating themselves. There's something very powerful about that. Cool. Anyone got any other questions as well? On that also, actually, then you might find that you love facilitation. I think I found that I love facilitation. I mean, I did it with teaching and stuff as well, but when from doing people's assemblies, I was like, oh, this is actually a really interesting process of kind of like figuring out how you can kind of hold a space where people share things. So yeah, I think it's good to bring in, get people to nominate themselves. Chris has a question. Go on, Chris. Go on, Chris. Yeah, I just want to come back to that bit about people nominating themselves. I think there's two sides to it. I absolutely agree if you can get people to do it, that they are more part of it, they own it. But I've also experienced cases in which the person who nominates themselves is that person who likes to dominate. Um, and so the facilitator can actually dominate the group and, you know, and you're not going to know that in advance. Um, and I'm just concerned, you know, at what can then happen. So if you've got any ideas or tips on that, I'd be um, grateful. Um, ooh, yes, that's also <laughs> can be an issue. Uh, I think with in the setup of explaining that the role of the facilitator is to ensure radical inclusivity, and maybe saying as a preface, if you're self nominating your, um, to be a facilitator, be aware that you're not going to your role is not to kind of like share in the same way that you can still have a point where you share your idea, but that should come after everyone else has had a chance who wants to. And um, yeah, it, it's not, yeah, your role is is about holding the space rather than sharing ideas. So maybe, I guess it's a, it could be useful to say that if you feel like you've got a lot to say on this topic, maybe don't self facilitate, don't uh, self nominate to be a facilitator um, because that can get in the way of ensuring that other people share. And also it might prevent you from being able to share everything that you want to. The other, the other thing to say is that if you set this up at the very beginning with everybody, that it's radical inclusivity, even if you get a dominating person, that somebody else in the group will interject generally. So everybody's holding that, which is why it's great to do that at the very beginning and make sure everybody understands that principle. Great. And I've seen that we've got, well, does that, is that, uh, is there, do you want anything else, Chris, or do you feel like that's kind of, Cool. Okay. I mean, obviously, they're they're not a perfect system, but they're better than what we've got. Um, so, James, I've seen that you said, can you clarify the difference between a citizens' assembly and a people's assembly? Uh, yes, uh, we have information on this in the manual as well. Um, a, a citizens' assembly is organised kind of to try and be representative of the population. So, people or whatever population. Um, in the kind of like if it's a nationwide one then it will be trying to be representative of the demographic of the nation so that people are uh, randomly selected by sortition to that um that represent the different groups in in a country uh whereas a people's assembly is self-selecting anyone can participate you can do them anywhere uh, a citizen assembly requires a lot more work in setting them up and a lot more money um and a people's assembly is yeah you can hold one on topic for anyone in any place um, okay, any, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, yes, Keith. Well, this is just, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on the term. So I hear the term deliberative democracy. So is that like, well, that's more in the characterization of the citizens assembly or is, are all of these different tools for different types of democracy? They're both forms of deliberative democracy. One's just kind of, citizen assemblies tend to have a more official stamp. So if it's kind of like a country organizing one being like we're getting people's views on this, this issue, um, but a people's assembly kind of 
is more yeah uh it kind of can can be held without that extra organization um but they're both forms of deliberative democracy because they're both in which people are discussing and sharing and deliberating together thank you you know, yeah, there, there are many 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 different types and it's important to choose the appropriate one for each situation so that's why citizen assemblies would work very well in with the large kind of groups probably they cost a lot but if you've got um something smaller then you you would probably go for a smaller event but they all have this kind of informed deliberation so input learning something deliberation and then decision making Okay, what we'll do now, if anyone's got any other questions, feel free to kind of type them in the chat. But what we'll do now is we'll have a five minute break so that you can kind of get up and stretch and not be so screen glued. Um, so yeah, if we come back at four minutes past the hour. So four minutes past seven. Okay, see you. See you in five, six minutes. But yeah, type any questions you got in the chat. Welcome back, everybody. Um, just checking everybody. So if you can put your camera on, we know you're definitely here. Um, just make sure you don't miss out on some key information. Um, so we're gonna, what we're going to do next is give you a chance to practice in a in a very safe space. Um, so take take this opportunity. It is a safe space. You're all being supportive of each other. And it just gives you a little bit of experience of just, just holding a space. And you'll all get a chance to have a go. You, you do about six minutes each. And you know, remember the, the main role of a, of a facilitator in the small groups is to ensure that everybody's included. So you'll be having a conversation. And remember, as participants, you're going to be helping by really focusing on uh, the conversation, listening to what other people are saying, actively listening. And if you're all drawing that intent, then it will help the facilitator as well. So that's something that you can do. Um, so we're gonna split you up into two groups of seven and I'll just share my screen with a few instructions on this. You'll be able to see them as well as hear them, which is always better. Um, okay. Now. There we go. So we've got about 45 minutes for the whole exercise. Um, when you get into your groups, I'll set you up in a moment on the on the question. But when you get into your groups, just introduce yourselves for a couple of minutes, not, not a couple of minutes each, but all together. So just go around very quickly, say who you are and um, where you're from or what you do. Um, and then go straight into the to the question and you're going to split up into um six rounds of six minutes so that's not seven i'll come on to the, the seventh person in a minute um so discuss the question um alternating each six minutes the new facilitator and if you can vary the note taking as well we'll give you a harvest document to write in so you can practice writing in notes it's good to experience that anyway but if you can't rotate every single time the note taker then fine you've all got different kits so make it work as long as somebody's making notes that's fine uh, but it's good to share it around. Um, so you'll do six rounds of just having that basic conversation. And each time you take over as a facilitator, your role is to just continue that conversation and bring in different people. Uh, you don't necessarily have to get around everybody each time, but you just need to make sure that everybody's getting a say overall. Um, and at the, the, the final seven minutes, uh, six minutes is going to be where the last facilitator just facilitates deciding as a group what your main one point will be. So you'll be making some notes and you'll get a sense of what the, the most important topic is, uh, the most important answer. And that will be what you decide as a group to bring back to the main the main room for sharing. OK, you can do one or two uh, or three if there's three, but uh, no more than that, please, because uh, we need to fit it all in when we share. Uh, and the notes go into the harvest document, which will give you access to in just a moment. Um, you'll either be in breakout group one or breakout group two. Uh, so be aware of which, uh, which group you're in. It tells you at the top of the room and it also tells you when you're moving. Um, and make sure you fill in the, the, the harvest document in the 
appropriate place. Now, Anira has put the harvest document into the chat. So can I ask you all to click on that now and open that up um, and, and just make sure you can get into it. And at the same time, I'm gonna post in the chat right now what the discussion question is um, with some instructions. So you can see, I'm just gonna read through these now. Um, so the question we're gonna ask you is how might we connect with people in our communities to bring about social change? How might we connect with people in our communities to bring about social change? And um, that's a very broad question. So social change, I know that includes climate change because that's the biggest social change experiment in, and task in the whole history of humanity. So whatever your interest is, you can answer it in that way, uh, tailor it to that particular uh, answer. Um, I've just reposted so, it in the chat so it says six minutes because it was saying seven minutes just because we're obviously some of our things say seven minutes is because because the amount of you that are we're having to put you into slightly bigger groups than which means that you can't have seven minutes each so we're thanks. doing six yeah I changed it on the slide but I didn't change it in the instructions thanks that's the advantage of having two facilitators you can uh, spot the mistakes um so just before we go in are there any clarifying questions on what you're being asked to do okay um we'll send you six minute reminders so you'll get a little note saying it's time to change over um and we'll see you back in about 45 minutes enjoy it Make great so just before i open up the breakout rooms uh nadia because i just saw you came in and i don't know if you'd fallen off the or not are you expecting to go into these the breakout groups yes please days? yes please i was just a bit late coming fantastic <laughs> okay okay uh right see you all in 45 minutes Roddy. so i hope you all had a chance to experience an element of holding a a group um we're going to, we'd like to hear your, your feedback in terms of the statements of the conversation. So let's do that first, and then we'll hear for a few comments on how you found the experience, just to reflect on that. And then uh, we'll finish up, but we've got an optional uh, extra little bit about dealing with difficult interactions. If you want to stay for that, we'll, we'll just cover that briefly. Um, so um, group one, um, can we hear from you first and your one, two or three statements, um, be good to hear those and then we will go to group two. Who's the, uh, who's gonna volunteer from group one, please? I think I'd better go because I was just writing it all down. I was trying to get into the document while you were speaking then. Um, so it's kind of a long point brings three really. So- uh, Simon, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Was... Maybe try with your, your camera off, that might be a better sound. Okay, right, let's turn that off, use the data. There we go. So yeah, we, we, we had a good discussion, lots of different ideas, and we sort of wrapped it up into one big statement rather than lots of little ones. Um, um, we agreed that we need to go to where people are to engage diverse groups of people using different methods, such as visiting clubs, libraries, door-to-door -door knocking, and making it relevant to people in whatever situation they're in, in a nutshell. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah, fundamental one there. Um, you picked up on in that group um, going to where they are, where they are not inviting them to you is is a well tried and tested approach to reaching out to broader groups of people um, anybody else from that group want to add anything to that just checking there's nothing else Karen Yeah, sorry. Um, just to add to that, and I think that was absolutely everything that we talked about, but it maybe got, gets a little bit lost that going to where people are isn't just physically where they are um, in terms of the different places and the different methods that we might use to reach out to people, but to um, make it something that's relevant. So the discussion is relevant to where people are in terms of what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. So because we've got climate changes like the overarching concern for a lot of us 
that for a lot of people it's it's much more basic and the um cost of living crisis is, is really looming yeah. as well so there's an intersection between those things definitely and it's an opportunity but it's somehow to frame the conversations that um really speak to where people are yeah. to get them on board yeah. and give them that voice as well yeah thanks karen yeah that's a really another really important point so i'm hearing you say it's not just a physical meeting people where they are it's an emotional and mental you know and cultural meeting of where people are and and that's a, a multi-dimensional challenge um and you also picked up on if i mean a lot of a lot of people are involved with climate and whether to we talked about this a lot in trust the people can you can you go and say this is the conversation and of course you can um, but that might not be what's on top for them. So uh, a more grassroots approach is to just have a more, even more open question than that. What, what's important to you? What do you like about living here? What's, what's already working well? And, you know, anything that engages people and then trust that the topic that you are interested in will, will come to the surface and obviously climate affects everybody. So that, that will happen, but it might not be the first thing you talk about. So thank you, Karen. That's a really valuable uh, discussion that you've had there. Thank you. Um, let's go to group two and let's, then we can open it up to anybody else who wants to say anything. So we group have a very, very similar, very similar outcome of our conversation. Uh, we would like to bring three main points. Uh, the first being using art as a, you know, kind of a language that knows no barriers and is open to everybody. Um, the second point would be, again, looking at the language we use and making sure that that doesn't become a barrier or something that's foreign to people, but really kind of creating accessibility through that. And then the third point was very much the same as was expressed by group one and by yourself, Paul, a moment ago, um, with the meeting where people are, but not intended just physically are, but where they are in terms of what their needs are. Um, and it did, the point that was made was, if we have a structure, if we have resources, how can we put those resources at the service of the needs that people honestly and, you know, express and identify, not as a way to open a discussion and then bring it back to the climate point necessarily, but just as a way to really create a community and trust in that, you know, dealing with climate emergency has loads of different faces. And actually, by attending to people's needs, we will find a way to attend to that climate emergency need as well. But genuinely creating, a, you know, genuinely serving the needs that exist, as opposed to go with preconceived agendas and just trying to yeah. you know, somehow <laughs> yeah. uh, bring them back there. But actually, honestly and truly create that engagement where, where people can use the resources available for what they actually need. Mm, absolutely, yeah. So some great overlaps with, with Group 1 there, as you as yeah. you described. Yeah. So using art uh, was something else you mentioned, so a universal accessible medium. And obviously language is a potential barrier, making sure that you're not uh, falling down into that trap. And then obviously what Group 1 were talking about as well. And and then just on that topic, there's loads of, we've, we've got a, in trust of people, we've got this tips and tricks workshop. Um, but this this is one of the things that will evolve as more people do people's assemblies to find out what are these initial questions that really light people up. Um, and you know, trying them out and finding out what happens is is obviously one of the best ways of doing that. And the more that we do, the more we'll find out these these nuggets. I was in a work in a meeting the other day and just did an optional share at the very beginning. And it was things that aren't as good as they used to be. And that was just it, you know. So people just spoke for, you know, 30 seconds on that. And it brought up so many different things. It was very, I've made a note of it, so I'm going to try that one again. So you'll stumble upon these these things that really in, engage people and and allow things to, to move forward. So thank you, Margarita. Um, anybody else from group two want to share anything that they... Anything else to add? Just checking. Okay. So uh, can we just um, have a quick check in on just uh, the process? I'm going to blow out the children's fire now we finish the assembly. Great. Thanks. And uh, if you're eagle eyed, you'll spot the cat wandering around in Argentina as well. Um, we will do pet sharing later. Um, 
how, how was that? How was the experience of, of holding? What, what did you notice? Um, we got to hear from a couple of people about the experience and what you, what you found that was useful. Anybody want to share how they found Helen? I thought it was great. And I thought it was very sweet how we were all trying so hard to um, respect each other and include everyone. I, I think what I learned from it in terms of practicalities was we, we ran out of time at the end to pinpoint our last, our main point. And um, so definitely to schedule in a little bit of time for that. And the other thing was if we had a shared clock that we could all see, we could all help the facilitator with, with the timing. So it's just a couple of practical things that mm. I thought about. Great. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, those those little gadgets, I've got one right here that I use. Um, you'll start to get those together, together as a kind of a, a facilitator kit. They're good to come with this. Sarah, do you want to come in, Sarah? Thank you. Um, yeah, I felt like it was a really safe space to be able to practice and, and to learn from each other. Um, and um, I do wonder how well behaved people would be in um, who weren't in this space, who were also going to be having their go at, uh, at doing some facilitating, but also just reflecting on how different it would be in person compared to how it is online, because I was conscious of have I got everybody's faces on my screen so that I can make sure that I'm seeing everybody and what they're whether they're wanting to contribute yeah that's a good point i didn't mention that at the beginning but but you know to have gallery view open on zoom so you can you can at least as facilitators see everybody that's really really important and yeah and, and um the other thing that you can do in a safe space like this is that you can be a little bit more of a um participant um aggravator or something just to make it a little bit more realistic but um, I mean, one of the things that's actually quite important in a conversation is to is to get over that that politeness in a group. You know, so it's, sometimes it's worth mentioning that. You know, how do we cultivate this? It's okay to disagree. It's okay to have a different view. We want you to hear. We want to hear from you. So if you're the only person who's got a an outlier view in that group, you may just go very quiet. That's not what we want. We want to draw that out because it's very important that they get heard. So other other comments thank you for that sarah and helen margarita i thought for our group i i really enjoyed the kind of the free flow of the thoughts everybody was sharing because i came into a completely blank and just like you know hearing other people thoughts generated thoughts in my own head as well and so i thought it was very interesting that we didn't kind of have a very structured kind of way of um, interacting and and I th I thought that letting letting that free flow you know kind of juices go at first is, it can be actually really, really interesting and and valuable and the fact that we alternated facilitating I think created a bit of team building as well and kept us going and not you know we. I certainly can go on and on for ages and then catch myself too late. And but you know, it gave us a bit of pace as well, is what I'm trying to say, and, and create a bit of team building and and a bit of pace in keeping our interventions kind of moving and not kind of going on and on too long. Right. Thanks, Margarita. And and, and presumably you're also practicing the experience of active listening as well, which is always mm -hmm. a good thing to know uh, personally what that experience is like, uh, so that you can. Uh, facilitate that for other people yeah. so thank you um yeah final comment from keith yeah I just you sort of stole my what i was going to say really this whole sort of thing of actively listening and not trying to be thinking about oh what do i think about that that that's a challenging thing for me um i'm a quiet typically sort of a quiet person unless i'm sort of one-on-one -on -one with people so there's sort of, um, it's easier to sit back. Um, I'm also conscious of the, the being male. So I tried to not to be the first, not to, you know, it's all these sort of being gentle with that. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the key is maybe um, ongoing training in this listening, you know, two ears. Yeah. So maybe yeah. more work on that. 
Yeah, thanks, Keith. And that reminds me of, um, you know, we're all learning this stuff as well. So be okay with not getting it right perfectly first time. There's always going to be more to learn and that's part of the journey. So I didn't hear from that person so much. So I'll learn that skill and bring them in next time and and so on. So uh, yeah, be 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 gentle with it. This is a, a learning curve for everybody. Um, James, I think you had your hand up as well. Do you want to come in? Yep, go ahead. Sorry, I just put it in the chat. As Keith said exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> ah, great. Okay. Great. Well, that's a, a testimonial to the synergy of the group that you've got in less than two hours. So um, well done for that. Okay. So uh, thanks, everybody. Um, there's a, a link I'm going to put into the chat, which is for the community assembly manual. Um, um, so that's going in there now. I'm just going to take it off direct and then get to that to everybody. So feel free to click on that link and squirrel that one away. Uh, if you haven't seen it already, it's quite a comprehensive document in terms of um, uh, how to run community assemblies. So, uh, but the best way to do it is to come to things like this and then just go for it. Um, they're relatively straightforward to do, and then you learn as you're going, going and doing them. So get one under your belt and um, you'll feel a lot more confident with it. And, and then it'll inspire other people and, you, and you're creating all these great conversations. And we know that we need these conversations. It's so important that people talk about the things that matter and we don't have that enough. So every single time you do one of these things, it's, it's bringing about the kind of democracy that we're looking for. Um, if you've got any feedback, um, you can send us an email. So I'll just pop that into the chat as well. Uh, always welcome to hear things that we can do better for next the next lot. Uh, Steve, do you want to come in on that one? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, you, you did mention um, something about handling difficult situations. Yes. Uh, and Ira, have we got time just to go over a little bit if people want to? We can just, what do you think? I'd love to, I'd love to learn a bit more about that, yeah. Let's do we that. Can, yeah, I, uh, we can, I mean, we've got some points that we can share on it, definitely. Um, and, uh, but maybe if, if others who are, who are, um, who need to drop off, then feel free if you have to drop off. Great. Okay. Well, let, well, let's start that now. So, I mean, officially, thank you very so much for coming. Um, I hope that's been useful. Uh, if you need to head off immediately, then please do. Um, and yeah, keep in touch and let us know how, how we know we're going to be involved with you uh, going forward. So we'll no doubt keep in close contact anyway, but uh, let us know how you're getting on and, and so we can support you. Uh, in the future with all the other assemblies we're going to be running. Um, okay, so let's let's do a little bit on dealing with difficult interactions. So um, sometimes when you're running assemblies or doing community work in general, you might have difficult interactions with people. Um, there's, whilst there's no easy way to overcome these, there are a few bits and pieces which uh, Naira and I will just um, go through and just mention. Um, and it's helpful, I find, to just have uh, an understanding of these in advance so you can be prepared, even just emotionally, because that's the thing that I find is if I'm just not expecting something, then it's harder to respond. So if I can preempt something, I think, well, that might happen and I can start to think about it and quite often if I can put something in at the beginning saying this is likely to happen, especially if I'm having a contentious conversation, like you're talking about something that's already polarized the country, then just allow people to understand that they're likely to hear things which they disagree with. And that's okay. And that goes a long way. So one thing that is a good idea is to refer to the line in the inclusivity statement, we welcome all people, but not all behaviors. So it's okay to say, actually, that that's across the line. We don't do that here. And and then also police that a little bit, Anara. Uh, you can also move in when people are interjecting or challenging or talking too much. And you can say that um, when you're in the breakout room, if, if anyone needs assistance, just like put your hand up and we'll come over. 
Um, and when you're doing that kind of state that radical inclusivity means that we have to have time for everyone um, and equal sharing and hearing time. Yeah, point. and another one is uh, just simply to thank them for their, their intervention. Um, and then it doesn't mean that you have to then have a conversation about it. You just say, thank you very much. And then you move on to the next person. Uh, so it doesn't drill down necessarily into something which might be a bit more contentious or controversial. So um, just a simple thank you for their input. And also particularly acknowledging the positive intent. There's always a positive intent there. So just, just acknowledging that and then people will feel heard and acknowledged and that's often enough if you want to um, express yourself, really get it, and then they'll go, fine, you've heard me, thank you. Anara. And uh, kind of, you can always think about the time as well. So like referring to the time and encouraging a quick roundup. So you can be like, I'm conscious of time and our agenda. What's the final point you want to make if someone's going off kind of on something? Um, and yeah, I think that's a kind of an important way of just remembering that discussions can be won by the people who, who make the most noise. So kind of finding ways to ensure all voices are heard is really important and, and referring to time is quite a good uh, approach to that as well. Um, someone interrupts, state the importance of ensuring people are listened to without interruption. So this is where you've got to as a facilitator if you set up a a ground rule at the beginning which we do radical inclusivity and hearing people and not interrupting if somebody does interrupt you've got to intervene because otherwise people will think well those boundaries aren't, aren't being observed and the safety will then disappear people won't feel safe in that group so you are being expected to hold that space well um, and if somebody does interrupt, just repeat that ground rule that we don't interrupt and um, wait for them to have their turn, Anara. Um, and then you can also offer to talk to someone after. So if someone's kind of like exhibiting difficult or dominating behavior, you may be like, do you want to chat about this in the break or afterwards? Um, because then it can kind of make them feel like they're not being completely shut down and that there is a chance for them to go go into this thing further. Um, but obviously it depends on you having capacity to do that, but that does work quite well. I did a people's assembly kind of last year, I think it was where we had someone who was very keen about talking about one issue and putting it kind of like uh, on, on the group quite a lot. And I was like, do you wanna hang on at the end and then we can talk about this in more depth um, and it worked quite well. So I think sometimes if people just wanna talk, um, giving them a chance to do so when it's not taking up everyone's time can be useful, but obviously it depends on your capacity to do that. Cool. Yeah, yeah thanks. And um, just carrying on from that, if there's somebody who is particularly um, determined to continue to have their say, um, you can use your body language and um, physical um, interventions to either just avoid eye contact from them if you're in a face-to-face -face situation so they're not they're not going to feel like they can come in again um and obviously you can then go back to them afterwards you know to to kind of hear them out more but during the session you're you're looking after everybody so you're managing that um and another thing particularly online you can use like symbols like this okay where they they hopefully will see that you know and you're, you're graphically um showing I, um, I, I need you to stop now or, or whatever it is you want to, to do because um, somehow you've got to find a way in if somebody is talking excessively um, and then I listen to people on the radio because they're very good with that because they've got no body language opportunities there and they have quite good phrases and they get in quite quickly okay so I'm hearing from you now and I'd like yeah I'd like to acknowledge and then hear and reflect back very briefly what they're saying and then say right can I bring whoever it is next in and then they've moved on so that's another way that you can uh, manage those situations and I reckon and then yeah if necessary kind of overtly clarify the objectives of why people are here so we're, we're kind of like okay our aim is to discuss this question and bring back three points that we're going to share with the wider group so to achieve these objectives we need to kind of hear from more people um 
And we do have um, this, all of this information is in the manual as well. I think it's on the last section of the manual. And in there, we do also link out to, um, to some things on uh, kind of using nonviolent communication for talking with people. So I'll just link that here as well. It's all in the, um, the manual, but kind of it's thinking about how to deal with conflict uh, using, using the techniques in this. I mean, sometimes these can be useful, sometimes it can't, it just depends on the situation. But um, in that is the, uh, this idea of reflecting back what someone said, which Paul just mentioned, because that, if you're just like, oh, I'm hearing that you're feeling quite stressed about this and that you've said these things, can make people feel listened to. Because um, you're like, yeah, that is what I was saying. And then that might make it easier to then move on. Um, so yeah, those are, I mean, when it, it's difficult, uh, sometimes, well, dealing with conflict, I mean, it's conflict for a reason that it's, uh, some of these things might work, some of them might not. I think a really important thing to do is if you're just making sure that if you're running a people's assembly, you're not doing it alone and that you give yourselves time to do like a debrief and a checkout. Uh, because then if something that like this has arisen, which it can, uh, then there's a little bit more of like the emotional support there. So um, sometimes it might be really difficult to deal with someone and you might not kind of get through in ways and, and that's not on you. That's just on whatever, whatever that person's going through, but making sure that there's a little bit of a support network for you after so that you can share and be like, oh, that was really difficult. Can I just like debrief a bit of that? Thanks, Anaira. Um, so that's the brief kind of coverage of difficult, challenging conversations. Um, I just wanted to give people opportunity to say, just, just to ask a question if there's anything burning, but um, I'd probably just only hear from one person. But the other thing I was going to say is if you want to practice uh, active listening, empathy circles are a brilliant way of learning that skill. So um, you can see the empathy circles on Facebook. Um, and uh, pop along to one of those you'll learn active listening very quickly if you do some of those um so that's it i just wanted to check if there's, if there's any burning question about um difficult interactions if not yes um sue there's a quick question would might there be a circumstance when you might actually ask someone to leave you know for the sake of the rest of the group i mean they're, they're like really really brilliant suggestions i just wondered whether you've ever had to sort of say actually would you like to leave and we'll be you know yeah i think i think that's perfectly acceptable if they are consistently transgressing the boundaries and you've established those at the very beginning um you just say no i'm sorry that's not what we do here um yeah absolutely i, I i've never had to do that in a people's assembly but yeah. anara have you had any experience of that uh no i haven't had experience that and i think there's a um i think it's really important to yeah ask people to leave if if they're treating people in an unacceptable way i think we also need to kind of be careful when we're in those situations um because there's a lot of uh, a focus on like creating a safe space um and sometimes if people feel uncomfortable um, I mean, it's not a bad thing to be uncomfortable. It might mean that you're being exposed to viewpoints that you haven't been exposed to and that you are kind of like having to engage with different perspectives in a way that you might not have had to before. And so um, just kind of like making sure there's a differentiation between it being like what it means to be unsafe and what it means to be uncomfortable. Um, and I think, yeah, that's quite important when it's in situations like because if your safety is at risk that's a very different thing but sometimes uh if there's if there's conflict and things to do with like race or to do with class then the people who might be organizing something might be from like a group that has been privileged and might be feeling uncomfortable about what's being said but their safety is not in question and actually it might be important to like hear those things so just keeping that in mind um but yeah, I think if 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 people are behaving unacceptably and their behaviour is um, kind of like like harming people and harming the space, then it is important to ask people to leave. Um, but yeah, it's a balance, isn't it? Because I think a problem with a lot of spaces that are about kind of trying to promote social changes is that they do tend to be filled with people of a certain skin colour from a certain background, and then that might mean when people come in from different perspectives and experiences and they're not necessarily communicating those in a way that
kind of like is regarded as like safe and uh, kind of, uh, kind of, yeah, safe and acceptable, then it might mean that people can be excluded. So we, it's just kind of important to be mindful of that as well. Usually people are very responsive to a reminder. They're not intentionally trying to disrupt. They're just forgotten and they get involved with their, their conversation. So just a gentle reminder is, is usually plenty enough. Uh, let's have a question from Simon and then we'll probably finish up. Yeah, Simon. it was more of a point, actually. One of the things I've experienced this week is on Zoom calls, you can get trolls dropping in. So be careful who you give the invite links out to. Don't push them out publicly and make sure you've got passwords that come back as well. We had yeah. somebody committing lewd acts and it was like the whole meeting had to get cancelled. All right. Thanks, Simon. That, that, that's a general point around knowing the, the, the equipment and how to use the, the, the platform you're using. So there are things you can mm -hmm. do in Zoom to get rid of that, um, uh, to eject people. Uh, so it's it's knowing those approaches in advance and getting familiar with your kit uh, is one way of doing it. And Ari, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, if you get a troll on Zoom, don't hesitate to kick them out because <laughs> that's an intentional people coming in to just disrupt mm -hmm. a meeting. Um, yeah, I think kind of be be more cutthroat on Zoom because it can be quite awful. It's awful if you're in something that's like Zoom bombed, like it creates a really horrible atmosphere. Um, so, yeah. I don't think kind of the waiting, like the what I was saying before about the kind of being uncomfortable thing is relevant there. I think Zoom. No, get rid of them straight away. <laughs> yeah. Zero tolerance. Yeah, I actually missed that call. It sounded like it was a bit of a trauma for everybody. I was like, oh dear. Mm. So I don't think the recording of that one will be going up on YouTube either. Well, I've learned how to deal with all those stuff, but I've never, I've never had it happen to me. So I'm, I'm kind no. of wishing, hopefully, one day it will, and then I can. Is it, zap, is it worth them. having sort of? practice sessions within your group i suppose isn't Absolutely. it actually get get like yeah. five or six people in zoom and practice kicking them yeah. out so when you need to do it you know what you're doing well i would i would say that's a good general rule anyway i mean i, I always do yeah. that with any any new facilitation I, I, i'm practice with the buddy and say okay well i'm mm -hmm. practice the sharing practice the setting up breakout rooms practice all of that so that you, it's second yeah. nature before you get going because it's a lot to think yeah. about on the fly and you've got plenty yeah. to worry about other than you know looking after the kit so yeah Practice, practice, mm -hmm. practice, prepare, prepare, and it'll be great. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll finish there. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, and um, thanks, Carolyn and Naira. Um, see you again in the Thank future. You. Thank you for giving up your time. It's um, you. been very entertaining and very rewarding. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A really great evening.